all. If you're new here, my name is Sabrina. I'm a first year medical student at the University of Chicago. It's been a little while since I filmed a sit down video like this, so I'm super excited to be talking to you today about Medicare for All and Biden's public option plan. But before I get into all of that, I first want to just thank you so much for the support on my Affordable Care Act video. I've really been blown away by the number of people that are watching and liking and commenting, um, and I'm so glad that so many people found it helpful and informative. So like I said, today I'm going to be going over the Democratic health reform plans, mainly Medicare for All and Biden's public option. If you're completely new to health policy, you might find it helpful to watch my first health policy video. I've linked it in the description box below. In that video, I explained some definitions and basic concepts in U.S. healthcare. So you might just find it helpful to have a little bit of a refresher before we dive in today. Before I talk about the substance of what these plans do, I first want to take a step back and talk about what these plans are trying to accomplish, what the major problems are in the US healthcare system. There are a lot of them, but I'm gonna talk about two in particular. So first, we have a pretty large number of people that are uninsured in the United States, around 28 million. And there are even more people that are underinsured for whom out-of-pocket healthcare costs are really high, are a significant portion of their income, and those costs likely prevent them or prohibit them from seeking healthcare. And both of these things, uninsurance and underinsurance, are a problem. The evidence is really clear that insurance increases access to regular preventative care, which can be life-saving. Not to even mention that medical bills can be astronomical, and many people go bankrupt trying to pay them, even with the financial support of an insurance company. So I think the first question that we should ask ourselves when we're thinking and talking about these different health reform plans is, are these plans going to substantively decrease the number of people that are uninsured or underinsured in this country? The second major problem that I want to talk about is healthcare costs. The U.S. spends a ton of money on healthcare. In 2018, the U.S. spent 16.9% of GDP on healthcare. That's nearly two times more than the average of the other OECD countries. And a lot of those costs get passed down to the individual. Despite the fact that we spend so much on healthcare, we're really not getting a lot of bang for our buck. We have the lowest life expectancy of all the OECD countries and the highest rate of preventable deaths. So the second major question that I want to ask is, are these plans reducing healthcare costs? for both this country and for the individual. So the first thing to realize about Medicare for All is that there's not one centralized plan that's on the table. This might have been something that you picked up during the Democratic primary when each candidate had their own health care plan and they were all named some variation of the phrase Medicare for All. In this video, I'm going to be speaking about the Bernie Sanders Medicare for All plan as it would lead to the most significant and sweeping changes in our healthcare system. But if you're interested in learning about the other Medicare for All plans, I'm going to link a great article by Vox in the description box below that does a great job of breaking down the differences between these plans. So Medicare for All would essentially create a national health plan, sometimes called a single payer system. Under the system, the federal government would provide health insurance to all Americans. The federal government already does something like this. It administers health care to all Americans above the age of 65 through a program called Medicare. So the name Medicare for All is more of a reference to how this new insurance program would be administered by the federal government rather than what benefits would be covered. The benefits offered under the Sanders plan are really robust. Americans would be covered for hospital visits, primary care, medical devices, lab services, maternity care, and prescription drugs, as well as vision and dental. This list of benefits is quite a bit more generous and expansive than other countries with universal health insurance programs, such as Canada and Australia, which do not include vision and dental benefits. The Sanders plan, unlike some of the other Medicare for All proposals on the table, would essentially eliminate private health insurance. The plan prohibits insurance companies from duplicating benefits or offering the same benefits or services that would already be covered under Medicare for All. And since Medicare for All covers so much, that really doesn't leave a lot for insurance companies to work with. This would represent a huge shift in the way that people get health insurance coverage in this country. The majority of Americans, around 55%, receive insurance from a private payer like Blue Cross Blue Shield or Humana through their employer. Also, unlike some of the other Medicare for All plans, the Sanders plan would eliminate a lot of out-of-pocket healthcare costs such as co-pays and deductibles. These costs are called cost-sharing measures since it's the individual rather than the payer insurance company that's responsible for them. Because most of these cost-sharing measures would be eliminated, Medicare for All would mostly be paid through a tax increase, primarily on the richest people in the United States. So now that we know what Medicare for All does, let's talk a little bit about 
how it measures up against the questions I posed earlier, whether it will do a good job of solving the major problems in our US healthcare system. First, in terms of expanding health insurance coverage, Medicare for All does a pretty good job. It establishes universal coverage, so everyone would be covered. But in terms of reducing healthcare costs, things are a little bit more complicated. On one hand, Medicare for All would dramatically reduce the administrative costs associated with healthcare, which are astonishingly high in the United States. You probably can already get a sense for this as an individual trying to figure out whether a provider is in network or whether a certain benefit would be covered, but there's a lot of bureaucracy in healthcare in the United States. And the fact that there are so many different insurance companies, each administering all these different plans, each with different benefits, really doesn't help to make the system less fragmented and less complicated. And the fact that our system is so fragmented and so complicated translates over to our spending as well. A 2011 study in the journal Health Affairs found that US physicians spend four times more money than Canadian physicians in dealing with insurance companies. And creating a centralized and much simpler system, Medicare for All would eliminate a lot of these administrative costs. Further, a single payer healthcare system would have the authority to set a single price for a specific service. So for example, a procedure like a hip replacement wouldn't vary so widely from hospital to hospital and location to location. And since the federal government is much more effective at negotiating prices than private insurance companies, that means the cost of each service would be a lot lower than they are now. I explained price negotiation a little bit more thoroughly in my previous health policy video, so I'll link that timestamp in the description box below. On the other hand, because the Sanders Medicare for All plan eliminates cost sharing for the individual, thus decreasing the amount that one would be spending on healthcare, people will likely use their healthcare more often. They'll go to see their doctors more, they'll go to the hospital more, and while some of that treatment is likely necessary, some of it may not be. This would overall lead to increased costs for the federal government. And because we'd be paying for this program through taxes, it would lead to increased costs for the individual themselves as well. But given that there are certain elements of the plan that lead to decreased healthcare costs and others that lead to increased healthcare costs, it's not really clear where we would end up once these things balance out. Moving on to the public option, President-elect Biden has mentioned several ways that he wants to build upon the Affordable Care Act or ACA. For one, he wants to expand subsidies to make the ACA's premiums more affordable. I've linked a really great article by the Kaiser Family Foundation on the impact of this below. But the most significant change that Biden has proposed has definitely been the public option. This essentially means that Biden would create a health insurance program that's administered by the federal government that could compete against private insurance plans on the marketplace. Unlike Medicare for All, the public option does not provide blanket coverage to every American. And instead, like the name implies, you would get the option to buy into the program. And in terms of benefits, the public option would be pretty similar to most employer-sponsored health insurance plans. It would cover the 10 quote-unquote essential health benefits that the ACA mandates that all plans must cover, including many of the benefits covered under the Sanders Medicare for All plan. It is worth noting that the public option likely would not include dental and vision benefits. Biden has stated in informal town hall meetings that these benefits would be covered, but I don't believe there's anything within the text of the plan that confirms this. Biden's plan does not eliminate employer-sponsored health insurance insurance, but it would allow people to opt out of their employer-sponsored health insurance plan and instead opt into this public option. The plan also has some measures to reduce deductibles and out-of-pocket costs, but it does not eliminate cost sharing entirely like Medicare for All. On the question of whether the Biden plan would reduce the number of uninsured people in this country, the answer is a little bit more complicated than it is for Medicare for All. In a 2020 study by the RAND Corporation, researchers predicted that the number of uninsured people would decrease only marginally, between 3 to 8 percent in each of their economic models. Given that there are around 28 million people that are uninsured today, even if we saw an 8% decrease, the highest that the researchers reported, that would still leave around 26 million people uninsured under Biden's plan. Moving on to costs, the public option wouldn't decrease administrative costs the way that Medicare for All would, but it does seem clear that it would decrease costs for the individuals that choose to enroll in the public option. That same RAND study from May 2020 found that premiums for the public option were 10 to 27% less expensive than premiums for private health insurance plans. And similar to Medicare for All, since the federal government is a more effective negotiator than private insurance companies, the price of each service, and thus the amount that you would have to pay out of pocket, would be lowered even if cost sharing isn't entirely eliminated. So in summary, Medicare for All does a better job of addressing the problems we're currently facing in our healthcare system, but it's also a much more ambitious plan, requiring a more dramatic overhaul of our current system and offering an even more sweeping set of benefits than other countries with established single payer healthcare systems. Medicare for All also somewhat eliminates the amount of choice that you get in choosing your insurance plan. 
though I would argue that you probably don't get much choice anyway since employees usually don't get a lot of say in what insurance plans employers offer them. I'll just quickly note that there are some exceptions to this. Some unions, for example, that have fought for better healthcare plans are big opponents of Medicare for All. In contrast, the Biden plan would lower costs for the individuals that choose to enroll in the public option, but it would not fundamentally change our healthcare system or solve many of its problems. I'll also note that the Biden plan is contingent on the ACA surviving its latest challenge in the Supreme Court. We're expected to receive that ruling in spring of 2021, so we'll see where we are then. All right, well, I hope that was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions or comments or suggestions for other health policy topics to cover in the comments below. Thanks as always for watching and I'll see you next time.